Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts. This is my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read this week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. So I feel like I'm getting caught up on my backlog of books and videos, uh, slowly but surely. Uh, so uh, thank you for all who watched my catch up videos. Uh, but let's get started because I read some really interesting books and the the magic that is the uh, serendipity of books talking to each other uh, happened. And, and I just, I think I've mentioned before how much I love when that happens. Uh, so let's start. The first book I finished was Otesha Mosveg's Death in Her Hands. So I've had this arc for a while, meant to, to, uh, to get to it. Finally, for some reason, just mood reading uh, said, okay, well, I'll grab that and, and, and get to it. I don't understand how she does it. I don't know how Atesha Mosfeg finds such boring, horrible women and, and she doesn't make them interesting, but the writing is so compelling that you want to find out what's happening with them. <laughs> Uh, my year of rest and relaxation is one of my favorites that I read. And that woman is horrible and absolutely boring, no redeeming social quality, but the story of what's happening to her uh, just propels you. The same thing is true in this one. In this book, we have Vesta Gull and Vesta is an old woman and she has moved in her older age into this kind of remote little small town. And she has her dog that she loves and she's very independent, very fiercely independent, proud of her independence. Uh, she reminds me in that sense of our main character in uh, Olga Tatarchuk's Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. God, just one of the best titles and phenomenal book about uh, cantankerous old women. Uh, this woman is judgy, boring, um, uh, very proud, very haughty, uh, ha very irascible, uh, but not in a clever, funny way, but just rude kind of way. Um, she's, she has opinions about everyone that she encounters. Uh, a lot of opinions about weight. And so there's a lot of fat phobia uh, I I evidenced in, in her worldview. And she is on a walk with her dog one day and comes across a note. And the note says that Blake is, is it's from someone named Blake and he has killed Magda. And that just sets her off. She doesn't find a body. <laughs> she can get, there's nothing except for this strange note that she finds, but it all of a sudden unleashes this imaginative torrent of, of um, role playing and thinking that she, who is Magda? It's gotta be someone in this town. Uh, Blake has to be someone in this town. And then she starts to construct in her mind uh, the life of Magda. Who is Magda? Who is she in this town? Who is she interacting with? And um, her, her mind just goes into overdrive. Uh, and as she invents a backstory for Magda, she also is comparing and contrasting that with her own life. And we see that she is in grief and hasn't really dealt with the loss of her husband. And so she is isolated and maybe going through a lot more than she is acknowledging. It was creepy. It's unhinged. Uh, it just as much as it was like drive your plow over the bones of the dead. It's also like Mrs. March that came out, uh, I think last year, uh, where a woman's imaginations kind of spin out of control. I liked it. I actually liked it much more than I thought I would. Um, the end is a little ambiguous and I think opens for a few different interpretations, but I don't mind that at all. Um, 
I just, I, I kind of marvel at what she is able to do as a writer. And, and when I talked about in, as I kind of opened this, this video, I talked about the serendipity. The serendipity is that this is the second book that I'm reading in a row that, ha that has a, that is talking about a character that isn't present. So, so much of what's being constructed is being constructed in absentia of the person that we're supposed to be, to be learning about. So, it, it, it's a, it was interesting to see this technique because it's such an interesting uh, literary device. It's such an interesting technique uh, to create a story about somebody else. And then what are you exposing about the character that we're actually with as they're talking about these other characters? And so to that end, uh, this is the book I wanted to talk about next. This is Encircling Volume 2, Origins. This is by Carl Frode Tiller, translated from the Norwegian by Barbara J. Havland. Uh, I've been reading this with Leo of A Little Book Life, and we're obsessed. The first one was unbelievably interesting. The premise of the story is that there's a psychiatrist who has put an ad in the paper of this small kind of isolated Norwegian area. And he is asking for help. His patient is a man in his 30s who has amnesia. And he wants to help him get his memories back. And so he knows who the man is or was. And so he's asking for people to send in letters uh, that, that explain who this man was. So amazing premise, right? Because then you're going to get all of these different variations and versions of this, this and, and create a composite of who this man was. Uh, so the format is usually, uh, or at least in the last book and in this book, is there's three people that we follow. And each of them, in essence, have their own story. Part of that story is going to be the letters that they write. And the other part are is who they are today. And just with death in her hands, what happens is that they end up telling more about themselves and who they want and who they want to be seen as than necessarily about David himself. Um, with the last book, I think the last book was such a strong opener. So interesting. This book, I'm starting to feel that there's some repetitive tick, stylistic ticks that, that bothered me in the first one. Now they're just getting annoying here. Um, specifically, in these moments of, of really intense interaction between characters, uh, the main character that we're following will do something that, it, that they don't understand and that you see them asking themselves, why am I doing that? This isn't, I don't even believe that. I'm, oh, I shouldn't do this. Oh, but I'm going to keep doing it. And it becomes this very strange meta conversation that they have with themselves that I, I, I just don't think is that common to be every single character to do something like this. Um, and I don't like it because it keeps pulling me out of the narrative. It pulls me out every single time I see it. And so far it's happened with every single character. It's still very interesting. There was a, a massive twist at the end of this, a couple revelations that happened that are, were shocking and a massive twist at the end that just as I was about to say like, this may not be for me. Now I've got to read volume three, which is the last of the trilogy. And at that point, we actually meet David. So uh, Leo and I of um, uh, Leo's Little Book Life on Instagram and I have been reading this. And uh, oh my God, the conversations that have come out of it are so deep uh, because it's such a psychological, interesting conundrum. It's such an interesting uh, theme and concept to be playing with. Uh, and the writing is so smooth and so interesting. Uh, you, you get nervous, you get palpably uncomfortable. Um, he, he's able to create these 
very claustrophobic feelings um, and scenes and uh, and you don't, and it's very, you only have little sex slivers with people. And so you don't know that much about them, but he's really helped you get invested. Unfortunately, I don't like a single one of the characters I've yet met, um, but we'll see if that changes. So yeah, this is volume two origins, uh, still, still in it. Then I don't know why. I think because I finished my book two prize reading, I, I just kind of felt free to do whatever I wanted. I thought, you know what? I would like some more Trollope, please. And I went online and I found some more audiobook of Trollope. I found Trollope audiobook to be so calming and relaxing. And I enjoyed Phineas Finn so much that I thought, okay, I, I've heard great things about the, the next one in this Palliser series. Uh, and this is number three, The Eustace Diamonds. My Lord, this was a great book. Just so, so good. With one very, very important caveat that kept it from being like a five star. Um, from the get-go, straight out of the gate, uh, Trollope just kind of lays it on the table. We have a young woman, Lizzie, who's married Sir Florian, and he has given her some diamonds to wear. And this is the family jewels. And she's decided she's not going to give those back. <laughs> she is. She is not sharing these with anyone. These are going to be hers. And Sir Florian is very old. Sir Florian dies pretty soon thereafter of natural, naturally. Uh, and she uh, creates this myth around the fact that he gave her these, these diamonds and these are now hers. These are not heirlooms that are owned by the family. These were gifts that he gave her, therefore they are hers. And she'll be damned if she's gonna be getting, get, getting rid of those. She is a horrible person. She's a liar. She's a manipulator. She can justify anything in her head. Uh, and she is a joy to watch. Um, so funny to see her get herself into these situations. And so frustrating uh, to see her get out of them and weasel her way out. She has a cousin, Frank, who she's very close with. And uh, she, she kind of has a way of trying to keep all of these men kind of, kind of in the wings to kind of pull on them at any moment uh, in case she would need something or want something from them. She gets, she realizes that she probably needs to find another husband because she's very young. She's in her young, in her early twenties. She becomes engaged to Lord Fawn. And when Lord Fawn finds out that he's about to marry someone and get, and then find himself in the middle of this debacle with these jewels that from his first, her first husband, uh, and he knows the family, the Eustace family. Uh, he tries to play peacemaker and diplomat. And so he tries to get her to relinquish and then, well, or to go through mediation and she's having none of it. Uh, and so it's really funny to see him try to force her hand and, uh, and have this young, this young woman just kind of stand firm. Ultimately, this was just like an adventure, thriller, heist, moral, moral story, romp. This is just like the best of the best, all of it, all in one. And the only reason I am not in, in completely sold and in love with this is because there was a character who's a pawnbroker that leveraged a lot of Jewish tropes and how it was written. And again, this is written in early in the late 1900s, so 18 something, 1880 something. But still, it was it was all it, it just felt gross. And at the very end, there's the introduction of a reverend, a pastor reverend, uh, who is from uh, Europe, and they they keep mentioning that, he, that they think he's Jewish. And I was like, but he's a 
reverent. And so then you start to realize, oh, Jewish is not about his religion. It's about his ethnicity. Uh, and the way that that was kind of, that Trollope kind of harped on that as a means of making him seem shady, uh, not to be trusted, uh, I, I really disliked that. And so for that reason, I cannot uh, give it five stars. You know, it's, it's something you've got to be aware of. And it's, and it is, I mean, luckily in this case, you don't have to be aware of it too much. It is so blatant. It is so blatant. Uh, so bummer on that, but ev otherwise it is, it is just so much fun. Then the last book I want to talk about is, uh, another continuation. I guess I'm just like in a, in a, in a, a series kind of mood right now. This is the next in the Martha Wells Murder Bot series. You heard it right, Murder Bot. Uh, I did not think I would be going for this, but Kazen from Always Doing put a video up out about uh, feel good books to read when times are when when the world's on fire or something like that. I, I get that title horribly. I mangle it every time. I'll put a link to that below because it has been giving me life. So many small, thin, little reads that that just kind of spark some joy and, and kind of revive you. And the Murderbot series is, is, has been a, a, an absolute delight. This is Rogue Protocol. So this is the third. Uh, I have to say this was a little less enjoyable than the first two. We have the same uh, character. Uh, the character is a robot, uh, a kind of um, augmented robot uh, that has sentience and has uh, is is thinking and is used as a contract uh, security uh, for different different um, types of of situations. But what's happened is that in the very first story, uh, they are given their freedom after really going above and beyond to save a group of researchers. Uh, what I love about the murder bot character, who is not named, they, they call themselves murder bot. What I love about this character is they are so ornery and they just don't want to be bothered with people. Uh, they're like the inter an introvert robot. All they want to do is watch their programs that they download um, and be left alone, but they keep getting pulled into things. Uh, and so it, it, you would never imagine that a robot has so much interesting, funny things to say. Um, but this one kind of la I, I'm not really sure what it was that, that wasn't as enjoyable. I think there, it was the dynamics with the other, uh, the other robots and the other people that they came into contact with, um, were just not as dynamic, not as interesting, it's still action packed. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of like, um, conflict scenes and fight scenes, which I'm not really in love with. And so I, you know, I'm going to keep reading a, a couple more and seeing if it gets the same kind of magic that it had in the first one. Uh, but it, it was a little unmemorable, uh, I have to say, but still fun. Uh, you know, it's really fast. It's a fast little read. So thanks, Kazin, for that recommendation. And that's all I have to talk about uh, today. Uh, I have uh, what I'm working on and, and, and uh, currently reading are Phineas Redux. So I decided to keep going with the trollop. So this is a book number four. I'm doing it in audio as well. And I'm trying to get some of my arcs uh, off of NetGalley uh, to kind of boost my rankings again. So I have the Marlowe Murder Club that I'm currently reading and uh, enjoying that. Nice little palate cleanser. And yeah, uh, I will keep you posted on that and more uh, as I get done with it. So that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for watching and we'll talk soon. Bye.